Okay, let's get started. Question one, how would you describe him? How would he describe himself? And why is it different? So how would you describe him? Let's see if we can find some evidence. Very first page of the story, page 35. His being blind bothered me. He doesn't like the idea of blind people. And then he says, my idea of blindness came from the movies. So we know that maybe he does not have personal experience. He does not uh, know anybody who knows a blind person. He gets a lot of his cultural information from the movies. Uh, and then when on the next page, when his wife tells him that Robert touched his fingers to every part of her face, her nose, even her neck. The word even, right? He feels kind of insecure about this idea. Maybe he's even feeling jealous. Uh, and then on the next page, when he, uh, it seems like he's being sarcastic. He says, maybe I could take him bowling. Uh, and then his wife, who is cooking, by the way, his wife is cooking, says, if you love me, you can do this for me. If you don't love me, OK. So he doesn't have an obviously happy marriage, right? His wife isn't able to say that he loves her. Uh, and then he says, I don't have any blind friends. And she says, you don't have any friends, period. And then uh, she mentions that Robert's wife is named Beulah. And he thinks Beulah, that's a name for a colored woman. So his uh, deceased wife uh, was probably black. And from the way that he reacts, we can see that he's probably not comfortable with this idea either. So the kind of picture we have of this man is not very uh, rich interior life, right? Doesn't have friends, has an OK relationship with his wife, doesn't like the idea of black people, doesn't like the idea of blind people. Uh, he gets most of his information from TV instead of like reading or experience or the conversation. He's really an isolated, spiritually poor kind of man, and he's also jealous. Uh, he knows that blind people see with their hands, but he's still jealous when Robert touches his wife's face and neck. Uh, so. Uh, he's probably also very insecure. Usually it's people who don't have a lot who are scared of losing it. So he doesn't have a lot in his life, so he's scared of losing what he does have. But how does he think about himself? If we look at his behavior, we can maybe see how he tries to present himself. Uh, on page 38, when Robert arrives, the blind man let go of his suitcase and up came his hand. I took it. Uh, and then Robert says, I feel like we've already met, which is a very polite thing to say. And our protagonist says, likewise, which means same. Uh, then he says, welcome. I've heard a lot about you, which is also a very polite thing to say. Uh, and then uh, our protagonist makes small talk. He offers Robert a drink. Uh, and later in the story, when his wife goes to bed, he stays up with Robert, keeping Robert company. So we can see that our protagonist tries to be a good host. He's probably thinking, even though I don't like this guy, he's my wife's friend, so I'll try to be polite for him. So maybe he thinks of himself as a good upstanding guy, someone who tries to do the right thing. So the last part of this question, why is there a difference between these two? 
Um, well, one group took this question actually, and they mentioned that it's really the difference between the objective and the subjective view of a person. It's true for all of us, right? We think we're one kind of person, but maybe everyone else around us thinks that we're a slightly different kind of person. It's unavoidable. Everybody uh, has this situation, but few people have a difference as big as our protagonist's difference. And probably it's because for things that he knows are right, he tries to do the right thing. But there are many, many things that he does not know are wrong. And so if he doesn't know that they're wrong, he doesn't know that he should do something else. So really the point of this character is not to judge him, but to see his limitations. We all have limitations. And learning about our limitations and expanding our views is a lifelong project. So our protagonist maybe has not done a lot of thinking and expanding, but maybe by the end of the story he will have expanded just a little bit. Question two, they finished the entire dinner. Why is this important? Why is this in the story? Page. I don't think it's page 38. I think I also gave you the wrong page number. Page 40. We dug in. We ate everything there was to eat on the table. We ate like there was no tomorrow. We didn't talk. We ate. We scarfed. Scarf means to eat big uh, mouthfuls of food. We grazed that table. Like you, you, they ate it like horses eat a field of grass. They eat until there's nothing. We were into serious eating. So like it spends like 10 sentences telling us how well they ate. Why is this important? Well, symbolically speaking, eating can also be a metaphor for feeding the spirit. In English, we have the phrase food for thought. Uh, we also have the phrase uh, food for the soul. So food is not just for the body, it's also for the mind and for the spirit. So here, the fact that they were so hungry that they finished everything. Right, next paragraph. We finished everything, including half a strawberry pie. For a few moments, we sat as if stunned. Sweat beaded on our faces. They were eating like it's exercise. Um, this perhaps is a symbol that they really lack spiritual sustenance, spiritual food. They're probably not physically that hungry. It's probably a spiritual thing. So we can think about these three characters. Why are they all spiritually lacking? Well, our protagonist, we just said, has nothing going on in his life, is very insecure. Uh, and when faced with something new, he doesn't really like it. So we can see why he might feel like he needs something more in his life. Maybe he secretly feels a little empty inside. His wife, his poor wife, has to live with him and has to deal with this man and she also has to cook dinner for him. So you can also think why she feels kind of empty, why she may may want more in her life. As for Robert, the whole reason he's in this story is because his wife just died and he's on his way to meet her parents. So, you know, he's probably feeling very empty inside, missing his beloved wife. So all three of these characters have a deep emptiness inside their spirit. Maybe that could be a foundation for their connection or for their compassion. And using a single dinner scene, dinner is when people come together to share food. 
So here, by sharing food and by showing that they eat in the same way, the author shows us how they are also in a similar situation spiritually. Next question. When Robert says he prefers color TV, the narrator says, I, I had absolutely nothing to say to that. So this is also on page 40. One group took this question. Uh, so Robert says, my dear, I have two TVs. I have a color set and a black and white thing, an old relic, Gudong. It's funny, but if I turn the TV on and I'm always turning it on, I turn on the color set. It's funny, don't you think? Uh, and then the protagonist thinks, I don't know what to say to that. I had absolutely nothing to say to that. No opinion. So the group that took this question thinks, uh, maybe the protagonist is just stunned. He's shocked. Something completely unexpected. So he doesn't know how to react. And I think that's probably true, but we can think some more about this question. In some other places in the story, the protagonist is also shocked or stunned. But every time he has some kind of reaction. So why here? is his reaction, no reaction. And in fact, he says no reaction three times. Well, the fact that he repeats himself three times might tell us that he's trying to hide something. In Chinese, we say right? there is no treasure here, which means there probably is. So what could he be hiding from himself even? He's even hiding it from himself. Well, Robert says, it's funny, don't you think? It's a question. So our first reaction is to try to answer the question. Is it funny? Is it funny that a blind man likes to watch color TV? It could be funny. But it could also be offensive to say that it's funny. So maybe the thing that the protagonist is trying to hide is he doesn't know what is the polite thing to say. If he says it is funny, is he being offensive? If he says it's not funny, is he disagreeing and arguing with his guest? So because he doesn't know the right thing to say, he denies having any thoughts about this at all. It's like uh, if somebody asks you a very awkward question and you don't want to say yes and you don't want to say no, most of us would say, I don't know. It's that kind of logic. But this is a very interesting moment because up to now, our protagonist has not shied away from being offensive, right? He thinks to himself he doesn't like blind, the blind man. He thinks to himself, it's very strange that he was married to a black woman. He's not afraid to think offensive things because he doesn't know that they're offensive. But here it shows that he is aware that doing something wrong may cause offense to Robert. And he's so aware of this that it's reflected even in his thoughts, not just his words. So perhaps from this point, this is where the protagonist starts to expand a little bit his perspective on the situation. He's facing the fact that there are other values that he has to recognize and he has to respect. Let's take a short break and we'll talk about the other three questions after the break, and then I will introduce the final exam.
Question four. Why is the cathedral the main symbol? One group took this question. And, you know, they first thought about the cathedral as a symbol in general. A cathedral is a really big church that it takes hundreds of people working over a hundred years to completely build. So immediately we have some key ideas. It takes cooperation and community and human connection. It's also a symbol of hope for the future because the people who start building it will not see the finished cathedral. So when you start building it, you have to hope that your children in the future will continue and will one day finish it. So already these two ideas are very closely connected with our story. The story is about human connection, right? How can this isolated, spiritually poor protagonist connect with somebody who is so different from him? And it's also about a kind of hope. The protagonist has nothing going on in his life. And uh, as we'll see later, he also does not really have a faith in anything. So is it possible for even this kind of person to regain hope in his life? To, is it possible for him to discover something to look forward to? Uh, and so those are the general ideas related to a cathedral. We also have more specific ideas from the story. Um, page 43 is where we first see the cathedral. Uh, the TV showed this one cathedral. Uh, and then I felt I had to say something. I said, they're showing the outside of this cathedral now. Gargoyles, like those are the monsters with wings. Little statues carved to look like monsters. Uh, and then when Robert asks the question, the protagonist doesn't have an answer. Uh, and then suddenly the protagonist thinks, wait, do you even know what they are? Do you know what they look like? Uh, and basically the idea is he's blind, so he doesn't know uh, what a cathedral looks like. He doesn't really have that idea. And you know, a it's very important to the idea of a cathedral to be able to see it. Right? These are big churches. These are really tall. Have you guys ever been to a cathedral? So if you ever go to a cathedral and you walk inside, usually you will the, the entry is quite far from the highest point. But when you walk inside, there will be like an entryway and then the space will open up above you. And it will gradually open up and you will see almost endless space above you. The ceiling is unbelievably high. And right underneath the highest point is the holiest part of the church. It's where the priest stands in order to conduct the mass, the religious ceremony. So in terms of theology, in terms of the religion, the idea of a high open space is connected with spirituality and holiness and connected with God. Today, you know, we're used to the idea of skyscrapers, huge buildings that you can't see the top of. But think about if you were living in the 1300s, the 1400s. And, you know, the hot, the tallest building in your town was three stories tall. And you go into the city and you look up at this massive church. You walk inside and you can't even see the ceiling. Think of how amazing that space would be. Think of how odd, how amazed and fascinated you would feel. The church, the religion, Christianity was trying to connect those ideas with the idea of God. 
And so being able to see a cathedral is very important to the idea of a cathedral. So here, of course, the blind man can't see the cathedral. Uh, and our protagonist is too spiritually poor to be able to accurately and movingly describe one. Uh, right, so next page he says, I'm not doing so good, am I? And so instead, Robert proposes that they try to draw a cathedral together. That way, um, he can follow along the protagonist's hands and can get a general idea of what a cathedral looks like. Um, but then he asks the protagonist to close his eyes and draw again. So at this point, it's not just about showing the blind man what a cathedral looks like. Now it, it's about giving the protagonist a chance to have a new kind of experience. And we're going to get to this in question five. Um, but we can see that this entire. All of it is very closely related to the idea of cathedral. So even though on page 44, Patton says, uh, Robert asks him, are you in any way religious? And the protagonist says, I don't believe in it, in anything. Sometimes it's hard. I think these three sentences accurately describe the protagonist's inner state, his interior mentality, his doesn't believe in anything. And so. And so sometimes life can be hard. But is it hard because he doesn't believe in anything? Or does he not believe in anything because it's hard? In a way, it doesn't really matter. The point is, how can he break out of this cycle? How can things change in his life? So by using the cathedral, it points to religion. But what it really does is it gives the protagonist the possibility of hope. Even if he himself doesn't think about it in terms of hope, we readers understand that is what it is. If he can build a human connection with somebody he doesn't like, if he can willingly uh, want to experience what it could be like to be blind, then there is still hope for him to change and grow and improve his life. So even if he doesn't see it, we see that the cathedral is a symbol of hope in his life. And question five, does he change by the end and why do you think so? So by the end of the story, uh, two groups took this question. They both agree he probably does change by the end of the story. So let's take a look at this. So at this point, uh, the protagonist is also uh, drawing with his eyes closed. Right, it's all right. Close your eyes now. And I close them just like he said. So we kept on with it. His fingers rode my fingers as my hand went over the paper. It was like nothing else in my life up to now. So at this point, the protagonist recognizes this is an entirely new experience. Then he said, I think that's it. I think you got it, he said. Take a look. What do you think? So Robert wants him to open his eyes now. But I had my eyes closed. I thought I'd keep them that way for a little longer. I thought it was something I ought to do. So the protagonist himself decides not to open his eyes. This is probably the first meaningful decision that he makes in the whole story. 
every other decision, he's trying to keep his wife happy. He's trying to keep his guest happy. But here he decides something for himself. He decides not to take the chance to open his eyes again and return to his old life. He decides to keep his eyes closed to pursue this new possibility. He thought it's something he ought to do. But even at this moment, he still can't conceptualize this decision as pursuing something new. He still thinks of it as doing what somebody or something wants him to do. He feels some kind of obligation but he doesn't see that this obligation comes from himself. He himself spiritually wants to experience something new. That's why he feels like he ought to keep his eyes closed. My eyes were still closed. I was in my house. I knew that, but I didn't feel like I was inside anything. Uh, so one group really focused on this sentence and they said that this sentence symbolizes he has entered a new state. He has become a different kind of person in his mind. Uh, and he, he thinks about it as he's moved into a new space. He's not inside anything. He's not confined in a restricted space. Everything is open and possible for him. But even now, he can't describe it. He's always been bad at describing things because he doesn't have an interior life. But here, for this entirely new mental situation, all he can say is, it's really something. And in fact, it is something. For someone who doesn't believe in anything, for someone who has no friends, something is positive. Something is better than nothing. So I think we can all agree that by the end of the story, he does change. He changes inside. And question six, how can you tell the story is written in the late 20th century? So let's take a look at these elements and events. We have a mention of Robert's ex or uh, dead wife named Beulah, which is probably a name for a black person. So that immediately brings in discussion of like black people's civil rights, the civil rights protests, changes in the culture regarding the rights and uh, culture of black people. You'll notice that the protagonist does not think, wait, his wife was black? That's illegal. It, it was already legal. I think interracial marriage was legalized in 1967. At the same time, the protagonist is still not very comfortable with the idea of a white man marrying a black woman. So the, the laws had changed and the culture was also slowly changing. And I think that perfectly describes the period right after the Civil Rights Act was passed. So late 60s through the 70s. Um, is this kind of cultural moment. People knew what was right and what was wrong, but it, it was hard to adjust for many people. Um, so we have discussion of like uh, black people's civil rights. Then we also have um, the counterculture. At one moment, Robert um, lights up a some dope. Dope is marijuana, dama. Uh, so this is connected to uh, the part of the counterculture related to drug use. The idea that many drugs are not as harmful as alcohol and that it's just something society doesn't want them to do. But in fact, some drugs might uh, let you have new experiences, new thoughts, um, new ideas, new feelings. And so uh, people started thinking it could be a good idea to try some new drugs. Uh, so it's a part of the counterculture, right? Culture that goes against the mainstream. 
Uh, so apparently Robert is from this part of the culture, right? He calls people bub. That's also kind of a very hippie thing to do. I'm a sheep eater. We can also say that there's some element of neoliberal capitalism in this story because neoliberal capitalism puts people against each other, individual competition. The protagonist, as soon as he learns about Robert, feels like Robert is here to steal his wife. His first reaction is, oh, we're competing for the same woman. Um, and we don't really know what the protagonist's job is, but it doesn't seem like he works in an office. Um, if you know a bit more about Raymond Carver and his stories, his stories mostly are about working class men. Uh, and so working class men are often the first to face any new economic changes and economic upheavals. Um, of course, when you answer the final exam, you cannot use information about the author, but I just wanted to give you some more information to better understand this story. Uh, and then the last, or not last, but there's another important one, which is in the middle of the story, they watch TV. We talked about the color TV, and this is only possible when most households have a TV and people know what you're talking about. And then the last important one is multiculturalism. We usually don't think of disability as a culture, but it can be. Someone who can't see, someone who can't hear, someone who can't walk, they have a very different life from people who can see, can hear, and can walk. And uh, so when disabled people come together, form communities to help each other, to share their experiences, that's culture. That's a culture. So here we can also understand this story as the encounter between two different cultures. One, a working class, able-bodied white man, uh, because he's working class, so he depends on his body for his job. And on the other hand, a disabled kind of freestyle drug using hippie. Two very different cultures coming together. OK, questions? All right, so if you don't have questions, let's talk about the final exam. The final exam is exactly the same as the midterm exam, but I'm going to give you something new to read. Here I want to remind you of some of the exam rules that a lot of you did not follow for the midterm exam. And there's one, uh, let's call it a new rule. So your answer must have multiple paragraphs. The paragraphs cannot be numbered. You cannot say, one dot, blah, 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 two dot, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and the new rule is you also cannot itemize your answer. What does this mean? Itemize in Chinese is fen xiang lie ju. So you cannot say like title, colon, and then start explaining, and then title, colon, and then start explaining. You have to write an essay. 用中文讲就是不能分享列举意思说你不能写标题冒号然后标题冒号然后标题冒号然后标题冒号然后标题冒号然后标题冒号然后标题冒号然后标题冒号然后标题冒号然后标题冒号然后标题冒号然后标题
You can only ask me, nobody else. You must give evidence from at least four different points in the text, not just four examples. So if your four examples all come from the same paragraph, that is one point. It has to be from four different parts of the text. And please give me the location right next to your example. Do not put all of your evidence at the bottom. So, first, not just Right,就是那个证据位置。不要就是全部塞到下面，也请也请不要把所有的证据都塞在下面，请把证据写在文章里面，边写边引用。Uh, there are example answers here. So if you're not sure how to do this, so for example, uh, this part of the answer has an idea, has some explanations, and then the evidence is inside the idea. Quotation from the text, location of the text. Same thing, next one. Uh, gives the evidence here, location, and then explains this evidence. And then again, another piece of evidence, the location, and then explaining this piece of evidence. So at the bottom, there's nothing, right? There's no evidence, there's no citation. It's all inside the answer. It's integrated into the answer. Uh, and the same for if you use information from other sources. I designed these exams so that you don't have to look for information. It is possible to answer the exam using only what we have discussed in class. But if you do use other information, please also give me the source and location as part of your answer, not at the bottom. Integrated into your answer. So those are the rules that uh, some people broke in the midterm exam. Uh, and then one last rule is written in the exam itself. You cannot use information related to the author or the date of publication. 出版年份作为证据. So in the midterm exam, some people said, oh, the author did this, cared about that, therefore, that is not acceptable. You cannot use the author as evidence. 不能用作者的生平背景,其他作品,任何相关资讯作为证据. Yes, so I will give, like, I didn't specifically cut out information related to the author, but that is to help you understand. It cannot be part of your answer. Do you have questions? OK, so after you answer the question, uh, when I grade it, I will write some comments under your answer to explain your grade. So if you have questions about your grade, you can look at my comments first. And if you still have questions, you can ask me. Um, oh, one more thing. I figured out a way so that after you submit your answer, you should get an email notifying you that you submitted an answer successfully. I don't know if it will work. Uh, and apparently it takes some time, like you maybe have to wait five hours. But hopefully this can help you 
avoid, you know, forgetting to submit your answer. 有时候学生会忘记把答案送出，或是送出不成功，所以我想我找到一个方法可以寄信通知你们，就是答案有成功送出这件事，但是不确定有没有用。然后听说可能要等个五个小时才会收到 email， 然后 email 只会寄到你学校信箱。Um, so you know, after you submit, you can wait a day. If you don't get anything, you can ask me, did I successfully submit my answer? So you know, 答案送出过一天没有收到信，你可以就是跟我确认。Okay, let's look at the exam. Uh, 看放大一下。Read the Grace Paley story, A Conversation with My Father, on the main Moodle page. Aside from the author and year of publication, how can you tell that it was written in the late 20th century, as defined in the handout? 以讲义所定义的二十世纪下半叶，以讲义所定义的。Your answer must mention the late 20th century. Your answer must mention the late 20th century. Hint, 提示 you can consider the story's characters, perspectives, setting, themes, language, and historical background. 就是人物啊，观点，时空背景，啊，不是设定，呃，主题。语言和历史背景都是可以参考的面向。呃、uh, ，and again, you don't have to fill this space. This is just to inspire you to write more. Okay, so let me show you the story. Okay, it begins here. One page or half a page. Let's call this half a page. One page, two page, three pages. Uh, so it's what? Three. Let's okay. Half. One. One and a half. Two. Two and a half. Three. Three and a half. Four. It's four pages. So it's not too long. Okay. Do you have questions about the exam? The exam goes until next Thursday midnight. 到下星期四午夜 Try not to submit at the last moment in case there are computer problems. 呃，如果大家都最后一刻交的话，可能会塞车，所以尽量不要拖太晚 Questions? Okay, the essay, or sorry, the story is now on Moodle. You can read it, and the exam will begin after this period ends. 文章开放可以读，然后考试从打钟开始。